Welcome to the Virtual Spring Meeting 2020, brought to you by the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. The Spring Meeting is the section's premier event, a multi-day celebration of learning and camaraderie. The Virtual Spring Meeting brings together the world's leading experts on competition, consumer protection, and privacy law, discussing the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome once again to the Virtual Spring Meeting. My name is John Roberti, and thank you for joining us today for our live stream, which is the, uh, the virtual keynote. And it's going to be on the science and structure of the cannabis and CBD industries, which, rate, um, uh, which drive very interesting regulatory, competition, consumer protection, uh, protection issues. We're going to be exploring those today with, uh, with, a, with a really terrific expert. Um, before we turn it over, I want to just uh, let people know we are in day three of the virtual spring make meeting, and I think uh, it's exceeded our expectations. Uh, things have really been incredible. We are at over 2,000 downloads for, uh, for the various program. We've had hundreds of people show up to our various receptions. So we're grateful and we're humbled by uh, your participation. Thank you for that. Thank you for supporting us. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to join the section yet, check it out. Go to ambar.org um, and, and please join up. If you want to learn more about the virtual spring meeting, it's all there at ourcuriousamalgam.com. So I'm really excited for this live stream. Let me turn it over today to the, uh, to the section chair, Brian Henry, who's going to kick it off. Brian? <clears throat> Thanks, John. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our virtual spring meeting keynote presentation. As section chair, I have the privilege of selecting our traditional Wednesday uh, uh, spring meeting lunch speaker. Although we are at the appointed hour uh, and you are having lunch at home and not at the Marriott Marquis in, in Washington, we are still bringing you our keynote presenter. Given the pre-corona explosion of the cannabis industry in both the U.S. and in Canada, I thought it'd be a great topic uh, for a spring meeting keynote. Our section members love learning about the dynamics and nuances of new markets. And I am certain uh, that none of them have had any prior exposure to this uh, industry whatsoever. Some of you may uh, be surprised to learn that many law firms now have very large cannabis law practices and that there's a lot happening in this space from a legal perspective. Uh, there are numerous second requests pending in cannabis deals. The FTC is monitoring CBD claims and bringing enforcement actions. The FDA is under pressure to sort out uh, the use of CBD in food and beverages. There's a lot of private litigation uh, that is occurring with respect to CBD claims. And, and literally just yesterday, an advocacy group called upon state AGs uh, to investigate claims that CBD uh, may be used to combat uh, COVID-19. I don't know about COVID-19, but I do know that the CBD version for dogs does wonders uh, for dogs who are afraid of thunder and lightning at, at 2 a.m. It just works great. So the timing is right to give our members a firm grounding on the science and the regulatory issues of cannabis and CBD. I'm really excited for you to hear our keynote speaker, who is a well-renowned uh, expert uh, in this area. And you'll have the opportunity to ask questions right on the, uh, the YouTube page. We will be monitoring those. And of course, I'm going to turn this over to our moderator and who's going to facilitate the questions. She is, of course, in California, uh, Kathleen Foote, uh, Senior Assistant Attorney General and Antitrust Chief of the California Attorney General's Office in San Francisco. So with that, Kathleen, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Brian. And, and before I begin to introduce our speaker, I want to thank Brian and the section staff uh, and uh, other assistants for their really extraordinary work in putting this gigantic conference online so successfully and under such difficult conditions. Uh, it's a real tour de force. Um, uh, we are, of course, officially at lunchtime, and most of you have spent the last few hours uh, uh, back east uh, working, uh, diving deep into antitrust issues and uh, other demands. So you're probably now ready to enjoy uh, something of a break, uh, 
something that's uplifting, maybe even a little soporific, and, but I think that is not going to happen. Partly that's because it's only 9 a.m. out here on the left coast, so we're still bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. But mostly it's not going to happen because we're about to hear a really compelling speaker take us on quite a remarkable tour through new and fascinating territory. Dr. Jeff Chen is one of the nation's leading experts and thought leaders on the interplay between the policy, business, and science of cannabis, hemp, and CBD, uh, together probably the fastest growing market in the country. Uh, and one of the greatest new challenges and opportunities, as Brian pointed out, for the legal world, that is certainly the case for state attorney general offices like my own in the areas of marketing, technology, healthcare, tax even, and consumer protection. At the age of 29, uh, Jeff Chen founded the UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative, which he has since led as director, one of the youngest leaders of a major university research effort, embracing an interdisciplinary faculty of over 40 people drawn from 18 departments across eight schools at UCLA. It's almost like my office. Uh, conducting cannabis-related research, education, and advocacy projects. He's not 21 any, 29 anymore, and in the intervening years, he's engaged in a wide variety uh, uh, of uh, discussions uh, with uh, stakeholders to influence policy, impact business practices, and educate the public. He's testified as an expert before the House Judiciary Committee. He's advised Governor Hickenlooper of Colorado, you may recall, the pioneer state in legalization, and spoken at venues ranging from South by Southwest to the Yale School of Management, and internationally at venues that range from the Mexican Senate to the Royal Palace in the Kingdom of Bhutan. And of course, we wonder what he said in those places, right? Um, his work has been covered by media ranging from Rolling Stone magazine and Time magazine to CNN and the Wall Street Journal. Dr. Chen is a graduate of the specialized MD MBA program at UCLA. And before that, uh, Cornell University, where as an undergraduate, he pursued an unlikely triple major in music, biology, and business. I'm delighted to turn the floor, uh, or, or rather the screen, I think, um, over to Dr. Chen now. Uh, you will have a lot of questions for him, I am sure. I think you will be able to turn them in anytime, and the ones he hasn't already answered by the time he finishes his presentation uh, uh, will be asked by me during the 20 minutes or so that I expect will remain before the luncheon ends and we send you on to the other sessions. Jeff, you're on. Great. Well, well, thank you, Kathleen. And again, thank you to the ABA Antitrust Law Section for having me. It's truly a pleasure to be here. And I'm about to take you guys on a whirlwind introductory tour, touching on the science, the policy, and the business of legal cannabis. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you've gained some more information for your own health, the health of your family members, as well as any of your clients that may or may not be intersecting with this fascinating world. And just to give you a sense of how increasingly embedded cannabis is becoming in every aspect, uh, a sample of some of the media outlets that have interviewed me in some of the places that I've spoken. So you can see it really does span cultural, scientific, and, and business and academic venues. And again, this is because this, this subject matter is so broad, and I hope to give you a taste of what's actually happening from the front lines. So here's what we'll talk about today. First, we'll start with a brief history of humans and cannabis. Then we'll actually talk about what is cannabis, because that term is wrapped up in a lot of uh, myths. Then we'll talk about what do we know as to what cannabis does to our human body. Then we'll start talking about the state of the industry, focusing primarily on the United States. And then lastly, we'll end with some future trends that you should be aware of that, are, that are, will unfurl in the coming years. All right. But first, before we get started, we got to play the name game. And that's because whether you're used to calling it marijuana or indica or sativa or hemp or pot, dope, Mary Jane, reefer, ganja, sticky icky, purple purple, or my personal favorite, the devil's lettuce, all of this stuff is referring to one species of plant, and that is cannabis. So that's all you need to know. This is one species of plant that 
all of this other nomenclature is drawn from. Okay, so we have recorded uses of cannabis going back 10,000 years, but that was mainly for its usage as cordage or rope. It wasn't until about 2,000 years ago that we have the first written recorded uses of cannabis as medicine. And interestingly, it was in, of all places, China, that they first wrote about the uses of cannabis for things like pain and inflammation. And it was actually this emperor, Emperor Sun Nong, who was credited with first discovering and writing about the medical uses of cannabis. And there's an old story where his court officers asked him, Emperor, how did you discover the medical uses of cannabis? And to that he stammered, well, uh, um, you see, uh, um, uh, uh, well, I, I smoked it, but I did not inhale it. <laughs> true story, true story. Okay, so after China, you see documented uses of cannabis appear throughout the ancient world. The Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Persians, the Indian Hindus. But it wasn't until about 1850 that you see cannabis pop up officially in the U.S., where it appears in the U.S. Pharmacopoeia, the official listing of all recognized medicines at the time. And what's very interesting is that starting in 1850, physicians could prescribe cannabis. And here's, here are just some of the conditions that cannabis was listed for in the pharmacopoeia. And I want to draw your attention to four of them. And that's because today, 170 years later, the scientific community is having a renewed discussion about, well, what happens to alcohol consumption when people start using cannabis? What happens to opioid consumption when cannabis gets legalized in a certain state? It appears to go down. What happens to pain? What happens to seizures when you apply cannabis? But these were recognized uses starting 170 years ago in the US. And the cannabis remained in the pharmacopoeia for another 100 years. It wasn't until about the mid 20th century where it was taken off the pharmacopoeia. And that's when the wave of prohibition began. And, and I won't get into that today. You can do a quick Google and you can see all the various theories as to why cannabis may have been prohibited. But just know that this concept of medical cannabis or even federally legal cannabis, that's not a new concept. In fact, we've had national legal medical cannabis. Doctors could prescribe it. You could go to your pharmacy and get it. It wasn't until the last about 70 years that cannabis has been prohibited at the federal level. Okay, so now shifting gears a little bit, we've talked about the history. Let's take a peek at what's actually inside the cannabis plant. But the first thing that we need to do is we need to have an anatomy lesson on the plant. So these are cannabis plants. These are grown outdoor and they're quite tall. Now, what I'm about to highlight in red is the stalk or the stem of the cannabis plant. And when we talk about the industrial uses of cannabis, it's often interchanged with the word hemp. And I'll explain more about that later. But just know that the stalk, the fibers of the stalk can be used for everything from textiles to paper, to construction materials, to car paneling, all sorts of quote unquote industrial applications. It's a very dense, tough uh, uh, fiber. The leaves, of the cannabis plant circled in right here, they are the, the engine of the cannabis plant. They convert light into food for the plant. They don't really have a particular recreational or medical or industrial application, they're, but they're needed for the plant's survival. Now in this photo, what I'm about to circle in red, that's a dude with a mullet. And while not exactly part of the cannabis plant anatomy, for the last 70 years of prohibition, folks like him were essential to the illicit growing of cannabis. And speaking of the illicit aspects of cannabis, it's really the flower of the cannabis plant circled in red here, where you have the medical as well as the recreational effects. And why is that? Well, because in the flower is where you have the densest concentration of cannabinoids. And these are compounds that are only found in nature in the cannabis plant. And there's close to, a, there's well over actually, a hundred distinct cannabinoids that have been discovered in the cannabis plant. There's two that you may have heard of, cannabidiol, CBD, and tetrahydrocannabinol, THC. 
The other cannabinoids we're just starting to scratch the surface of. We really don't know what they do. But speaking of CBD and THC, let's talk about what we do know. They are the most abundant cannabinoids in cannabis, and they're also the ones that we know the most about. So THC, as many of you might be familiar, personally, is responsible for the psychoactivity of cannabis, the intoxicating effects, the high. CBD has no such effect. It's non intoxicating THC is also responsible for the dependent qualities of cannabis, and I'll touch more upon that later, where CBD has no such effects. In fact, CBD is actually demonstrated to have anti-addictive properties against other addictive substances, particularly like opioids. THC can cause motor impairment. That's why there's concern about cannabis and driving. CBD does no such thing. And lastly, THC can cause something, again, some of you might be familiar with, the munchies, where CBD does not have appetite stimulating effects. So at first glance, these are both present in cannabis. They have seemingly very different effects. However, there are some areas where they overlap. And both have been demonstrated to have antioxidant properties, anti-inflammatory properties, anti-cancer properties, actually killing, shrinking, inhibiting the growth of cancer, and neuroprotectant properties, protecting brain cells against damage from, say, stroke or degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. However, huge, huge, huge caveat here, and that's potential. All the four things I've mentioned here have only been studied in animals. They have not been studied in humans. And there's lots of instances where things that sh show promise in animals do not pan out in humans. So that is a huge caveat here. And I'll talk more later about why there isn't more research yet. Here's another interesting thing. The imbalances between these cannabinoids have been shifting over time. So this is a chart where law enforcement will test cannabis that they seize. And what you see is over time, there's been a dramatic spike in the amount of THC relative to CBD in popularly used street cannabis. Why is this important? Well, the cannabis that we used for thousands of years, we're not really sure what composition of cannabinoids were in there. Again, there's 100 cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. Whereas when it went into the illicit market, there was such an emphasis on THC because the customers were primarily purchasing it for intoxicating effects. So by promoting THC, you were in essence crashing levels of other cannabinoids. And so who knows what the therapeutic efficiency or the therapeutic optimum of cannabis is with all these cannabinoids when there's just been such a pure singular focus on THC. Now, there's another interesting twist here. If you've ever smelled cannabis, you're not actually smelling cannabinoids. You're smelling things called terpenes. And terpenes are present throughout the plant kingdom. They just happen to be particularly abundant in cannabis. So here's an example of a terpene. It's called linalool. It exists in cannabis. It also exists in lavender. Linalool has its own anti-pain, anti-anxiety, and calming properties. And so now when we start talking about the effects of cannabis, what portion of those effects are driven by THC or CBD or terpenes or the other 100 cannabinoids? And that's where this question becomes very complicated very quickly. All right, now shifting gears again, let's start talking about what we know definitively that cannabis does to the human body, both the good and the bad. And first we need to talk about how cannabis affects the human body. So for the longest time, we did not know why cannabis affected us. And it wasn't until the 1990s that scientists discovered a system in our bodies called the endocannabinoid system. So named because endo, internal, cannabinoid, cannabis-like. And what scientists realized was our bodies produce things called endocannabinoids. And the cannabinoids produced by the cannabis plant look very similar. And so when we ingest cannabis, what's actually happening is our bodies are reacting as if it were our own endocannabinoids. And initially we thought the endocannabinoid system was just present in our brain, where it regulated things like mood and memory and sleep. But later we found that it's present throughout our body. In our blood vessels, it regulates blood pressure, 
in our fat cells, it regulates energy storage. On our immune cells, it regulates inflammation. It's in our major organs. It's in our bone. It's in our muscle. It's in our skin. It's in our reproductive organs. And so it comes as no surprise that the endocannabinoid system is involved in maintaining normal function of a variety of different physiologic aspects of our health, mood, memory, sleep, appetite, pain response, immune function, energy metabolism, and reproduction. Okay, so let's talk about what we actually know from human studies about THC. So we have lots of data that THC can be useful to help people who have nausea. It can also be useful to help people who are losing weight and want, want to gain more weight. It can also be helpful for people who have pain. And that's about it. The rest of the stuff that we have is either little data or no data whatsoever. So here's what we have, a little bit of data on what THC can be potentially beneficial for. Post-traumatic stress disorder that, for instance, some veterans might suffer from. A, uh, a motor disorder called Tourette syndrome. And some sleep disorders. But again, there's only a little bit of data on that. We have no data. And when I say no data, I mean we do not have placebo-controlled clinical trials. That's kind of the standard for medicine. You have lots of anecdotal, but in medicine, we don't really consider that evidence. So there's really no data on what THC does for things like anxiety or depression and many, many, many others that I'm sure you've heard of, cancer, Alzheimer's, things like that. And so this is important just to show you how little science there actually is and how much stories there are about cannabis or THC. Now, what about CBD? So again, we have lots of data that CBD is useful for pediatric epilepsy. And that's about it. We have a little bit of data that CBD can be useful for treating addiction, particularly addiction to opioids. It can be useful for reducing psychotic symptoms in people who have schizophrenia. It can be useful for treating anxiety and it can be useful in certain sleep disorders. And then we have no data on whether CBD does anything for pain or depression. And the pain thing is particularly interesting because of all the people buying CBD right now, pain is probably one, the number one or number two indication. Again, no clinical trials looking at pure CBD for pain. And again, many other things that you've heard of, stories we do not have any data on whatsoever. All right, now let's talk about the negative health effects because this is something that the cannabis industry tends to gloss over. All right, we'll start with THC, then we'll talk about CBD on the next slide. But for THC, the first harm to be aware of is schizophrenia. And it appears that in people who have a genetic risk for schizophrenia, using THC can actually increase the odds they develop the condition. So anyone who has a family history of schizophrenia should probably stay away from THC. Also pregnancy, right? THC is not safe to use in pregnancy. We see that there's associations with lower infant birth weight. Adolescents who use cannabis, we see associations with lower educational attainment and lower IQ. And the brain develops until the age of 25. So it shouldn't be using cannabis, it shouldn't be using tobacco, it shouldn't be using alcohol, ideally. THC is addictive, both physically and psychologically. Also, THC can increase your, can double your risk of a traffic accident while driving. Now, a caveat here. When we're talking about pregnancy, the risk to the adolescent brain, addiction, and driving, THC is harmful. However, if you compare it to something like alcohol, it is not as harmful as alcohol is to pregnancy, adolescence, or the addictive potential of alcohol or the driving risk when inebriated from alcohol. Now, two other areas that are interesting, we actually do not see an association of cannabis and lung cancer. So even people who smoke cannabis for decades, we see no increased risk of lung cancer, interestingly. And there, again, there's never been a recorded death from cannabis use. And also, uh, as you guys have questions, please type them in, and then we'll address them 
at the very end. And that's, why we, that's the best way we can get through everyone's questions. So we'll, there'll be ample time for Q&A at the end. Just keep them coming in um, and, and the, the, the hosts will be sorting through them. Okay, however, there is one number that I wanna focus on. And this is a major harm of cannabis that the media is glossing over. And I really want to emphasize it today. It's a scary number, 118,721. Those are the amounts of lives of Cheetos lost every minute because of the harms of cannabis. It's a travesty, it's an epidemic, Nobody is doing anything to protect Cheetos from the dangers of cannabis. Okay, but all jokes aside, let's talk about some of the adverse effects of CBD. There isn't a ton, but there's a few that we should be aware of. Okay, so the first one and the real one is drug interactions. And we have data that CBD can elevate the levels of other drugs that you might be taking in your body. And if those other drugs at these elevated levels have side effects or toxicity, that's not a good thing. So we gotta be very careful of that, this, this notion of interactions. Also, we don't know what CBD does in pregnancy, it hasn't been studied yet. So in general, women, uh, pregnant women stay away from CBD. And also we don't know about the long-term use of CBD. Remember that chart that I showed you where the illicit cannabis market had dramatically spiked levels of CBD through their breeding practices and crashed levels of other cannabinoids, uh, sorry, uh, spiked THC while crashing levels of other cannabinoids like CBD. So what that means is we actually have lots of data on what using high THC cannabis does to you when you're smoking it for 20, 30, 40 years. We do not have data on what using, say, high CBD cannabis does to you for 20, 30, 40 years. So that is an area that scientists are actively trying to understand better. All right, so now let's shift some gears and now we'll start talking more about this policy and business governing cannabis. Now, I'm sure many of you are aware there's this state and federal conflict where you have 23 states in the US that have legalized cannabis for medical use only. Additionally, there's 10 states that have legalized it for adult use. So generally it's anyone over the age of 21 can purchase cannabis or if you're under 21, you need a doctor's note and then you can use cannabis medically. So that brings us to 33 states, despite the fact that at the federal level, it's still a schedule one drug. And it's been a schedule one drug ever since Nixon, the Nixon administration in 1970. Schedule one drugs are defined as the most dangerous drugs in America and they have no medical use. And it's lumped together with drugs like heroin. And this is why it's so difficult to do research on cannabis in America, because you need special licenses from the DEA. You need to justify why you want to study the medical use of cannabis, even though they've defined it as having no medical use, et cetera, et cetera. Here's another interesting thing. Despite all this, the FDA has actually approved pure cannabinoids. So on your left-hand side is a drug called Marinol. It's pure THC. FDA approved in 1986 to treat cancer symptoms and to treat weight loss. On the right-hand side, you have pure CBD approved two years ago to treat kids with epilepsy. And so again, you have this weird patchwork system. 33 states have legalized the plant. The feds say the plant is illegal. And then the FDA says, if you have pure cannabinoids that are detached from the plant, we will approve those as drugs. Let's talk about some market sizes for a second. So by 2025, the legal cannabis industry in the US is projected to hit about $40 billion in annual sales. And that's at a 25% compound annual growth rate, where globally by 2025, it's projected to hit about 150 billion in annual sales. And if you look at down the breakdown of recreational versus medical, most of this growth and market size is gonna be driven by medical. And that's because most of these states and countries around the world that have legalized cannabis have only legalized it for medical purposes. So those sales figures that are happening, that growth is still gonna be predominantly medical in the, in the next five years. All right, here's another interesting thing that has happened 
in cannabis over the last 10 years. I call it the productization of cannabis. And so for many of you in the audience, going back to the good old days in high school or college or during the 60s, the way that you consumed cannabis predominantly was you got a hold of the plant material, you threw it in a bong or a water pipe, maybe you rolled a doobie with it, maybe you baked it into a brownie every now and then, but predominantly maybe you were smoking it and that's how you enjoyed it. But over the last 10 years, as cannabis has become legalized and real businesses have popped up, they've manufactured products out of it. And how do you do that? Well, you start by extracting the cannabinoids out of the plant material and you result in this oil, this wax, that's very, very highly concentrated in cannabinoids. Once you've kind of detached the plant material, you can take this oil and you can make it into a vape pen. You can bake it into edibles. You can put it into a tincture and you can put it into say a skin cream. So this is the first time ever really in the history of cannabis that you've had starting to resemble consumer packaged goods and products. Now, despite this, flour is still supreme. It's still the number one selling category compared to vape pens, edibles, tinctures, skin topicals, etc. However, flour has lost a lot of market share to vape pens, which are close number two. And if you see the trend, there is a downward trend for flour because over time, people are going to move to these derivative products because they're sometimes more convenient to use, as well as there's a general trend away from combusting and smoking anything out of concerns of lung health and the backlash against tobacco. So eventually flour is going to decline to maybe a niche product, and then you'll really have the, the, the dominance of all these other forms. Now let's talk about why do people use. And I don't think there's set parameters, but it's really these overlapping reasons, recreational, wellness, and medical. So let's talk more about that. The recreational consumer, they're predominantly interested in THC. They want to be intoxicated. And they want, and reasons for that include relaxation, enhancement, and we do see that the use of cannabis enhances sensorium. It heightens your sense of smell and taste. That's why food uh, is yummier. It can also enhance your sense of touch, which is why some people report more sexual pleasure when acutely intoxicated. It can also enhance your sense of sound, for example, which is why maybe music or concerts might be more enjoyable or that bass line in your favorite song you've never heard before until you, you know, had some cannabis. Also, consumers generally, you hear this theme come up that they think it's a healthy alternative to alcohol. In contrast, you have the wellness user. They're, they're not trying to get intoxicated. And so that's generally why you see them prefer products that are either pure CBD or predominantly CBD with, with a little bit of THC. They don't want intoxication. They might have some minor aches they want relief from, say arthritis or low back pain. They might want to sleep a little better, or maybe they, want, they, they feel stressed out. And when they use a, a predominantly CBD product, they feel like they can, uh, their stress levels go down a little bit. And then the third bucket is this medical consumer. And these folks, they don't care whether or not they get intoxicated. They don't care whether they use THC or CBD. They just want to get better. And that's because they have serious conditions. They might have very severe pain. They might be on opioids. Maybe they want to reduce their opioid use. Or they might have post-traumatic stress disorder, and they're not able to make it through the day or through the night without having flashbacks or nightmares. Or let's say there's someone who's sick with cancer, and they can't eat, and they're losing weight, and they're in lots of pain and, and discomfort, et cetera. And so these three categories I just talked about, they're not mutually exclusive. You might have someone who's a recreational user on Fridays, a wellness user on Tuesdays, and then once in, every now and then when he has a really bad flare of his back pain might become one of these medical users. So it's really these overlapping uses and these multi-purpose uses of cannabis, which is really fascinating because that doesn't really exist. If you look at alcohol, no one's really using alcohol to treat their arthritic pain or, or things like that. Okay, another interesting thing you might have been aware of that happened over the last year is the vaping epidemic. So up from then up until this point, you've had roughly 3,000 cases, about 100 deaths. And this happened from both nicotine vaping as well as cannabis vaping. And almost all of the people who got sick, it was linked to illicit products. 
people who purchased an illicit product from a dealer or got one from a friend. Virtually no cases were reported from regulated products sold in regulated stores. And the culprit turned out to be vitamin E. And it appears that what happened was you had illicit operators who were making vape pens in, in kind of pop-up facilities and, to, and they used vitamin E as a thickening agent to make the vape oil a little thicker and flow better. And they thought vitamin E was safe, which it is when you're ingesting it by mouth. But when you inhale it and it goes into your lungs, it can damage your lungs and leading to these uh, respiratory issues and sometimes failures and deaths. What about cannabis and COVID, right? The reason that we're all having this digital conference Again, as it, as it goes to show how embedded cannabis is in our society right now, there was lots of impacts here. So the first thing is, as people were hoarding toilet paper, myself included, I'll admit I was guilty of that, people were also hoarding cannabis, leading to historic sales spikes of cannabis, never before seen sales levels of cannabis. Also, in most cities and states that had legalized cannabis, it was deemed essential. Stores stay open, and they saw a significant increase in sales of cannabis throughout this time. Unfortunately, there's lots of, there were lots of people touting that cannabis or CBD could cure COVID or prevent COVID or treat it, and there is no evidence that it can do that. And this led to the FDA coming down with warning letters um, on, these, on these people. And also, remember the $2 trillion COVID relief bill? Well, unfortunately, because cannabis companies are illegal, they are not eligible for any of the assistance uh, from that. Furthermore, companies that were uh, indirectly operating in cannabis, say, you know, companies were structured to say, like, we aren't a cannabis company, we are a brand, and we license our brand to an operator who puts cannabis product into our packaging. It seemed that even those operators weren't able to get any sort of benefits from the federal relief bill because they were still they were still too close to cannabis. A third thing, or a fifth thing to think about is that as we head into a recession, potentially, cannabis sales are unlikely to be impacted. Uh, again, as, we, as we've seen with things like alcohol, um, cannabis is probably going to be recession proof. And in fact, as cities and states grapple to make up for lost jobs and to make up for tax shortfalls, I wouldn't be surprised if legalizing cannabis or supporting cannabis industries more is one way for them to reliably increase jobs and increase tax revenue. All right, what about hemp-derived CBD? This is a fascinating area right now. So this started because of the 2018 federal farm bill. And this farm bill, which was pushed primarily by Republicans who wanted hemp to be a new cash crop for their rural economy, who no longer had cash crops like, say, tobacco. And what they said was the species of plant cannabis, if the THC is low enough, we're going to call it hemp. And we're going to say hemp is no longer a dangerous drug. It's a legal and valuable agricultural crop. Now, because they defined hemp as just low THC, you can get all sorts of other things from hemp that you can also get from marijuana, like CBD, like other cannabinoids, like terpenes, etc. So the interesting thing is that earlier when I said CBD has been shown to help things like schizophrenia and addiction and anxiety and certain sleep disorders, those were studies done using anywhere from hundreds to even a thousand milligrams of CBD a day. The reason that's important is that when you buy these over-the-counter CBD products, they're really only dosing that pill or that gummy in, in maybe several tens of milligrams a day. And those low dosages have never been studied in humans. So we don't know if 10 milligrams has the same effect as 200 or if it has no effect at all, right? So that's an active area that we need to study more. Also, currently no regulation on these hemp-derived CBD products, uh, but the FDA has issued many, many statements that they are going to regulate soon. Now, here's the interesting thing. By letter of the law, CBD cannot be sold as a dietary supplement. And that's because a pharmaceutical company already got their CBD approved as a drug two years ago. And so there is this clause in the Food and Drug uh, Act that says if a drug's already approved as a pharma drug, basically you can't sell it as a supplement, right? Or else it wouldn't make sense for pharma companies to put all the time and effort into approving it. But because 
there is so much public demand for CBD and also politically, the politicians want CBD to be sold as a dietary supplement. And here's why. For a farmer growing hemp to sell the CBD to a supplement manufacturer versus taking that hemp and selling it just for the stock for fiber, say to make textiles, it is 10 to 100x more valuable to sell that hemp for CBD supplement manufacturing. So if you take away the use of CBD as a supplement, you pretty much just took away a huge chunk of that cash crop of, of, of hemp that was supposed to be delivered to all these communities. Again, particularly rural agricultural communities. And that's why Republicans were the ones pushing for hemp legalization in the first place. So the FDA doesn't have a lot of allies in its fight against CBD as a supplement. Also, CBD currently is a several billion dollar market already in the US, projected to be a $9 billion market by 2025. And CBD can cross state lines readily because it's hemp is now federally legal. Lastly, I'm gonna to touch on some future trends that you should be aware of that are gonna come un unfolding in the years to come. So on the topic of interstate commerce, right? CBD can cross state lines, but cannabis still cannot. And that's because the federal government has basically said, if you are compliant with your state laws regarding cannabis and your product does not cross state lines, for the most part, we're gonna leave you alone. But cannabis companies are still spreading across state lines. And the way they do that is not by having product cross state lines, but by having trademarks and branding and packaging and trade secrets and equipment and IP and personnel cross state lines. And that's why you have cannabis companies that are operating in 15 different states. They just have to go to each new state and kind of like Immaculate Conception, rebuild their production infrastructure, but they can keep the same brand, they can ship equipment over, they just can't ship cannabis material between state lines. Now, the rise of brands, this is another fascinating area. Five years ago, if you walked into a cannabis store in the US, there really weren't brands. You didn't go in asking for Mama Ray's cookies. You went in asking for, I want some cookies that have THC in them. And they would give you some generic cookies that might not even been labeled with the, the manufacturer, for example. But now you have the rise of brands and the brand battle is on. Everyone's trying to grab market share because they realize as cannabis becomes a commodity, it's the brands that are to maintain the retail price. For instance, the price of a can of Coca-Cola doesn't change when sugarcane drops half in price. Advertising, this is a fascinating area as well. Because cannabis is not federally legal, you can't advertise on TV. It's really hard to advertise on radio. The big internet companies, Google, Facebook, uh, Instagram, YouTube, they will not allow cannabis ads on their platforms. And so companies have to resort to hyper-local archaic measures, really uh, billboard ads, bus, bus stop signs, or a whole new area of advertising in general, influencer marketing. Finding someone who has a large social media presence, having paying them and having that social media influencer uh, put up a post about their brand, which might reach their followers. Okay, two very fast growing new demographics of cannabis. So baby boomers are the fastest growing demographic of cannabis users. And the, the thought is that in the 60s, they became familiar with cannabis, then they stopped to focus on family and career, and now coming back into, say, retirement, where they might be looking for alternatives to alcohol, they might have some minor aches and pains, they might be looking for better sleep, gravitating towards cannabis now. Also, the pet industry, a massive area right now for cannabis, and that's because pet owners uh, have this, first off, pets don't necessarily have a lot of insurance. So rather than taking them to a vet, getting a prescription for meds, there's a lot of pet owners who are now popping CBD themselves and then giving them to their pets. Um, as we heard even just at the beginning, um, some of our hosts talk about. Here's another area that's happening. Rather than going from selling cannabis based on where it was grown or selling cannabis based on what strain of cannabis it is or what it smells like, you have companies now who are shifting to selling feelings. So I'm, I'm a cannabis brand. I have five products in my product line. This one's for sleep. This one's euphoria. This one's for creativity. This one's for relaxation. And this one's for sexual arousal. So companies selling feelings now. Now, none of this is grounded 
in science. Uh, but down the line, people might crack the code and realize that a particular cannabis strain or a particular combination of cannabinoids and terpenoids does consistently induce creativity. And so this notion of selling feelings is only going to accelerate in the cannabis industry. Speaking of cannabinoids and terpenes, we're going to see more and more of an emphasis beyond THC and CBD, these other hundred cannabinoids, these other hundreds of terpenes that are present that all have some effect. It's just the science isn't good enough to tell us how to leverage and use them, but that science is fast coming. Lastly, financial services. So because cannabis companies can't bank, they are often stuck having to go to pop up merchant banks or lenders who, specialty lenders who, who have sprung up to service them, right? So what happens when you can't get working loans very easily? Well, you gotta raise a lot more equity financing from investors than a typical, com typical company might because that's your only way to get cash. Well, what happens when you can't get mortgages? Well, then you're forced to buy and own your property, your cannabis real estate outright and have a bunch of cash tied up in it. Uh, what happens when you can't get traditional insurance services? What happens when you can't get credit card processing, et cetera, et cetera. So you're, you're left working with a lot of cash or, or working with these uh, small pop-up shops that are, are offering insurance services to cannabis companies or credit card processing or credit unions and states that are offering banking services. All right, so to recap what we've talked about today, we've had a long and legal history of cannabis with humans. Cannabis consists of THC and CBD, but many, many other compounds as well. There's really only been a few human clinical trials, but there's been tons of animal and anecdotal data, which is why you might be hearing so much stuff in the media. There's this state and federal conflict, which poses tons of issues around cannabis. And lastly, those seven trends we just looked at, cannabis has got a far ways to go before it becomes a mature consumer packaged good, just like we see with, with beverage or alcohol or food products or say tobacco. So uh, thanks again for having me. We're gonna open it up to questions soon. Um, if you would like to follow me on social media, it's at uh, DR Jeff Chen. And also you can shoot me an email if you have any follow-up questions or anything like that. I know this is a very confusing and new area to look at. So you can shoot me an email at help at drjeffchen.com. And now we will open it up for questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, fascinating, really fascinating. Uh, we have a bunch of questions uh, coming in and uh, let me start, I'll just start at the top. Um, consolidation, you You've mentioned, mentioned that it is occurring, occurring uh, at pace. Will it continue? And if so, why? Great question. So what has happened about a year ago, the cannabis bubble popped. And that's the, when you saw valuations of cannabis companies, both publicly and privately, tumble as much as, you know, 80%. And so since that popping of the cannabis bubble, cannabis companies have been, it's been so difficult for them to raise money from investors. And again, because they still can't get working loans from banks, a lot of them are in a cash crunch right now. And that is further driving consolidation. And so you're having lots of M&A activity right now because cannabis companies cannot subsist. They do not have the cash to subsist. Um, another reason that consolidation is happening now is, is you, because you don't, because the Fortune 500 companies are essentially locked out from cannabis, you had way too many small businesses, entrepreneurs, small mom and pop shops pop up than you would have, say, like how many uh, energy drinks can you really have on a national level? You know, top five players might control 50% of the market. But for cannabis, it's so fragmented because the big players couldn't come in. So you had way too many little players pop up and it's just not sustainable in a market to have thousands of brands in the state of California, for example. So that's why consolidation is happening too. It's just you cannot have this many companies that are able to maintain profits. Well, let me follow that one up then uh, on, that, uh, on that note. Um, do you, as there is more consolidation, uh, and you talked about the fact that there are uh, uh, people, uh, the, the major companies are crossing state lines uh, 
in uh, not not in the not in the product itself, but in all the other all the other aspects and and levels. Um, do you see this going kind of the way the beer industry has gone, with the, the big ones are taking over a lot of the a lot of the marketing uh, and, and distribution functions and uh, putting a lot making it basically making life a lot more difficult uh, for uh, for for the the small craft producers um that i mean that really impact that 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 has a lot of competitive implications as most of us listening know and i'm very interested in hearing your take on that how that will play out is it going to be different or not yeah that's a great question so what is i guess what is what first thing to maybe think about is there are lots of folks who say well you know California is where it makes sense to grow the stuff because we have we already produce half of the U.S.'s produce. We have lots of farmland out here, lots of sunlight. You know, we should just grow it here. And once federal legalization happens, high quality, cheap cannabis flour will flow throughout the country. And all the guys operating in in, in Michigan and Illinois, where they just can't compete at on cost, they're going to go out of business. Um, uh, the counter argument to that is that because states have been in charge of their own industries for so long, they're going to have incentives to protect their local uh, companies, their local cannabis industries, because of the jobs at stake and, and, and all of that. So they might put in, it might, it might come at a state level where states have protectionist measures to protect their own industries, whether it's uh, making it very difficult for, an, uh, for a company coming in to get a license to distribute, for example, mm-hmm. um, or perhaps increasing taxes on, on product out of state, or maybe even somehow banning sale of cannabis from out of state. Um, and, and, and even for alcohol, uh, apparently you saw this as well, is where it's, it was very difficult for alcohol made in one state to necessarily enter another one um, if, if that state felt mm-hmm. threatened by it. Mm-hmm. To answer your question about whether it'll go to the three-tier system of alcohol, where retailer, yeah. distributor, yeah. and... and um, manufacturer are separated mm-hmm. it hasn't necessarily been the case in some st- first off that was a vestige of you know the best thinking that we had 90 years ago when, when prohibition was lifted if you look at states like california which is you know right now 50 percent of the legal u.s cannabis sales are happening in california california initially wanted to limit that model but they went away with it so in california it's a free-for-all um uh, you can you can the, the, you can have vertical uh, integration um, of that. So as to where it will go and how the federal government might weigh in to institute a three tier system versus states who say, well, screw that, we already have the system that's working. Um, that that's that's a really interesting. Way. And the, the other thing to think about is if the states have already openly defied the federal government when it was illegal. If the feds do try to impose some regulations, what's to prevent states from saying, well, we've already been doing it this way for 10 years. We like the jobs. We like the current way that it's generating tax revenue. We're not going to change things. We already defied you when it was a Schedule One drug and you threatened to call in the DEA. Now you're telling us to do something different. You know, why would we now listen? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. What 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 are the what are the drivers of competition in this space from you know from the standpoint of consumers I suppose you've talked about branding, um, uh, price, um, uh, price quality, functional benefits. Um, what are the sort of key factors, or do we know yet? Are you tracking that? Great question. Yeah. So we actually we do have some pretty good sense. That, well, first off, there's Every state really has a, because it has a completely different way, regulatory mechanism, some are legal, some are not, and the consumers are different, right? So California has a very rich history of cannabis because it was being grown in Mendocino and Humboldt and the Emerald Triangle for, for decades, the best cannabis in the world. But it's in a place like California, for example, price seems to be a very almost the number one feature that people are purchasing on. And I think that trend is also present in many other states. But using California as a good example, because California has such a long and mature 
cannabis culture and sophisticated user and sophisticated brands and products, looking at California, in my opinion, is a way to kind of peek into the future of what does this look like. And in California, price seems to be almost the number one driver of, of cannabis. Um, and that's also because users, it's, users don't really know yet what to look for in quality. And by that, I mean users are still purchasing predominantly based on price and how much THC is in here. So, oh, here's a cookie that has 100 milligrams of THC, and it's the same price as a cookie that has 75 milligrams. Well, THC is what I want, and so I'm going to buy that. They have yet to start really thinking about the nuances of the experience. What other cannabinoids do I want in there to modulate the effects, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, but right now, it is predominantly price. And with labeling, um, some of the labeling will begin, will get more sophisticated. So percentage THC and things like that uh, are, are not necessarily going to be uh, the most specific kind of criteria in terms of identifying what you're getting. That's such a great point. Yeah. So up until a few years ago, mandatory labeling wasn't even required for cannabis, right, in many states. Now it pretty much is. So you, and you're right that initially they were just labeling THC because that's just what the state was said. That's the bare minimum to label. Uh, but now companies are labeling other cannabinoids, uh, including CBD, but, but as well as the other ones, as well as terpenes. And really this comes down to an issue of consumer education. The, and this goes to another choke point in the process, which is consumers are predominantly getting their education at the store from the people that work at the store, these colloquially called quote unquote bud tenders. Mm -hmm. And in many states, including California, there is absolutely zero training or certification to be a bud tender. Uh, you need a certification training to cut somebody's hair, right? But you, or, or to serve someone an alcoholic drink at the bar, but you do not need to do that to be a bud tender. So many times these bud tenders are giving advice as if they were a pharmacist or a doctor or an expert in the effects of cannabis when they were just someone who was hired three days ago and getting paid minimum wage and have, has no training. And so consumers are getting this incorrect information uh, from that. So that's a, that's, a, that's a choke point that needs to be fixed at a regulatory level. There needs to be some certification and, and training for bud tenders because they're now going to influence consumers' beliefs, attitudes, and perceptions about what's an appropriate dosage or is this going to help my cancer? Like, is it going to shrink my cancer and, and all this stuff? So there needs to be better, better system in place there. Okay. Um, shifting gears a little bit. Um, you talked about the need for uh, more robust investing uh, because of the lack of uh, the sort of banking lending resources and so on. Um, and I suspect all of us, at least in California, know people who are uh, who either are beginning to invest in this area or are thinking about it uh, and studying it, and there are advisors, investment advisors, and so on. What you know? What 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 are we looking at eventually? Are we looking at uh, mutual funds, um, co-ops? Um, what you know? Is it all going to be? Uh, uh, are there going to be any form of kind of exchange traded? investments what do you think mm, yeah so so right now something interesting has, has happened uh many of the canadian cannabis companies have gone public and they've been listed on major u.s stock exchanges the new york stock exchange and the nasdaq and the way that they rationalize it is okay it's not cannabis is not legal in america but you're a canadian company and it's legal in canada and you're making cannabis there and you're not shipping it into the U.S. and breaking U.S. law, so we'll allow our securities exchanges to list it and we'll allow U.S. investors to purchase it. So you can purchase stocks of companies that would be illegal if they were operating in the U.S., but because they're just operating in Canada and other countries, you can buy them on these major exchanges. And then U.S. cannabis companies who are federally legal have also gone public. They just have not gotten on to a major exchange like the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. So they're traded uh, over the counter. So you can right now as an investor buy uh, many large U.S. federally legal cannabis companies and buy their stock and, and trade it and buy and trade it liquidly. Liquid, liquidly. 
So because cannabis companies couldn't get working capital, because they had difficulty raising money from investors one at a time, uh, several years ago, during and as the cannabis bubble was like rising, many of them hopped on this uh, IPO wagon and, and became public companies on the, on the OTC, on the over-the-counter exchanges. Um, and so now what does the future hold? I, you know, I think, honestly, I think federal legalization is coming sooner, faster than people think. I think maybe in the next three to five years, we'll have some major, major, major federal reform around cannabis. And that's when it'll start normalizing just like any industry. You'll have people, you'll have venture capital funds popping money into early stage startups. You'll have mature companies that are public traded. You'll have mature companies that are not public and are just you know, owned in a private equity portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. I think the co-op model, um, people are experimenting with the co-op model uh, in places like uh, the, the Emerald Triangle in California, where the farmers are banding together uh, to maintain some sort of negotiating power uh, in, in how they how they how they operate, so that that is that is being experimented with. Great. Well, the questions keep coming thicker and faster the more you talk uh, about uh, some of the, the the research issues and the market getting ahead of the research and uh, uh, all kinds of different things. But I think we are uh, getting very close to wrapping it up here. And so I am going to turn this back mm. to Brian. Great. Well, thanks, uh, Kathleen. And thanks, Jeff, for such a fascinating, uh, interesting presentation. Um, it's really uh, it's going to be interesting to watch how all of this develops over the, uh, the next couple of years. But um, thanks for attending um, our session. And thanks to everyone out on uh, YouTube watching the program. So we hope you enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks, ABA.